This morning, I want to quickly go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 because this morning I want to give you an opportunity today. I don't want to finish too late. I want to give you an opportunity for you to respond to this message. Every Sunday, we this isn't just simply you receiving and, and as you listen to a, 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 a good teaching or you simply watch a movie or you watch a TV show and you receive and you might be entertained and you might even learn something. But if in the sermon there is not a response, why do you think we end every single sermon with a time of prayer and a time of worship? Because it is you receiving, but then taking the step of responding toward it, at least giving you the opportunity to do so. And so this morning, as we go to his word, I want to give you a, a special opportunity today to respond to what God is telling us. And so let us go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And in verse 8, I want to remind you that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. It is a church that started to believe, a city that was so overwhelmed by sin and by the culture of that time that the Greek uh, society, the Greek culture, the, the, the Greek philosophies, and yes, even the Greek religions was affecting the way these people who were saved from all of that, but they were bringing a lot of that with them into Christianity. Uh, again, like I, like I mentioned it sometimes, think of your tia, think of your grandma that still brings some of the old traditions of their pagan cultures and, and, they, and they just kind of shake it up and call it Jesus. You've been to those shops, maybe some of you, looking for a remedy and you go and find some, uh, some, some, some plant or something that, that one of your tias or an aunt told you that that's going to heal your son's cough. And you walk into that pharmacy. It's called a pharmacy, but it's also witchcraft. You walk in and it's, and it's all these different kinds of smells and, and, and different types of things. And then you see all of these different idols and statues of Jesus and, 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 and some lady and, and all of this other stuff. You see it there and all these different saints. And they dressed up the old cultures, the old traditions, the old religions, and they call it Jesus. Well, this isn't anything new. 2,000 years ago there in the city of Corinth, it was happening. People were now simply bringing some of their pagan traditions and cultures and thoughts and the way they thought about God. They were bringing it now and they were calling it Christianity. But the sin was so bad that they were saying that even themselves as Christians, they could live in immorality and yes, even in fornication within the church temple that in the church they were they were fornicating they were sinning they were they were living immoral lives and then saying that that was in worship towards god paul has to write not one letter but two to correct them and part of this correction there in second the second letter in second corinthians chapter 7 in verse 8 it says this you go ahead and go there on the screen it says i am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, the first letter. Because he's saying, now I'm having to send it again, that second letter. Though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Let me tell you, there's moments where, especially on this Sunday, there's going to be some things that the Lord wants me to say that uh, for a moment in my own heart, I'm going, this is too hard. This is too difficult. There are people that may not be able to receive this. There, there might be people that are going to walk out today because it's too hard. It, it, it's too strong because the heart of a spiritual father, as the Apostle Paul was, he's saying, I'm sorry, this, this, this hurts you. Uh, uh, but I know that it was painful to you, but it was just for a little while. At the moment, you might not like it, but it's only for a little while. Because verse 9 says, now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent. The pain caused you to repent and change your ways. We don't come to church because we're somehow masochist, because we like the pain. We're, we're, we're not weird. We not like coming to church and be told that we're sinners. We don't like coming to church just simply because we want to be told, even though there's some people that like that. There, there's a lot of people that like going to those type of churches where they just like smacking with them with the Bible and telling them about how much they're sinners and they're going to hell. And then the sermon just ends there and people leave happy. It's, it's just crazy to me. 
uh, uh, that's foolishness. But he says, it's not because I made you feel bad that I'm glad I, I wrote that letter to you, but because that feeling, that conviction led you to finally repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow, say that word with me, sorrow. It was a crying out. It was a, a, a just this, this feeling of, of crying out to God, this, this spiritual, for lack of a better word, a sadness, a sorrow that God wants His people to have. He wants you to have a godly sorrow so you were not harmed by us in any way. In verse 10 it says, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience, what is your will, God? What is your will, God? What is it that you want me to do? He is speaking to you right now. Hear the voice of God directly in your ear right now. Jesus said, if you have an ear to hear, then listen. Listen to his will. He wants you to experience. It's this godly sorrow that leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, as soon as you hear that word sorrow or sadness or crying or pain or depression or anxieties, you start thinking, of this kind of sorrow. It lacks repentance. It results in spiritual death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourselves, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such readiness to punish wrong. You showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right. When you hear the Word of God, not the teaching of a pastor, not the proclamation of a prophet, not simply the, the, the new revelation of someone that you like watching on TikTok, but when you hear the Word of God, it should lead you to do these things, to have an alarm, to want this, 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 this clearing of yourselves, this longing to see, to hear Jesus, to, to be freed from whatever you know and you have learned that the Word of God is saying and that you do everything possible to make things right with God. I hope that when you hear the Word of God and when you read it for yourselves, as James says, do not simply read it or hear it, but take action upon it, but actually live it out, but actually take what you're receiving on a Sunday morning. And what do we do? We live it on Monday morning. And But what it should be doing is leaning you to want to do everything necessary to make things the right way. We've been talking the last few weeks, today being a whole month, four weeks, our fourth week of this series of habits of a healthy heart. And remember the verse that we've been looking at. It's been talking about from Romans chapter 12, and it's not on the screen just yet. But in Romans chapter 12, the, the scripture says that we need to let our sacrifice be no longer animals as it was required in the Old Testament. God was trying to teach them that death was necessary. That He was being merciful and He was saying rather than you dying as it had happened before, whether it was Sodom and Gomorrah, whether it was Cain and Abel, whether it was there Noah and the flood, sin causes people to die. But he says, rather than you dying yourselves, as the Apostle Paul said to the church in Rome, the wages of sin is death. And I'll go back to that scripture later. But because there is a necessary punishment of that sin, because God is a good, a, a, a just judge, He is fair. And because He is fair, something, someone has to die. But because He is merciful and amazing in His grace, He did not require them to die, but an animal to die. And some of you that love animals, you should. You should feel that feeling of that is not fair. It's not. 
Some of you that see a cute little lamb, a, a, a nice little dove, a bird, and yes, even pigeons were used as sacrifice. They would say, well, I can't bring an ox to you, God, but here is a pigeon in my own poverty. Here is an animal that must be shed of his blood for my own sin. And God would take that as a, as a punishment for a while. But every time of worship, every time that the people of God would come together, there was either a sacrifice of a bird, of an animal. Sometimes it was simply them recognizing a sacrifice at the altar of their best, of their first fruits, of their first harvest. They would bring and sacrifice that to God as, as the smoke would symbolically go into the heavens. It was all a sacrifice. It was all a sacrifice because they recognized that there was a sin that needed to be punished. But then in Romans chapter 12, in the first couple verses, it says that He does not require any longer a sacrifice of an animal or of a thing or of physical blood because He already sacrificed the Lamb of God, His own Son on that cross, His blood was sacrificed in our place. When you start thinking about all of this, it all begins to make sense. It all falls together. It, it, it makes sense. And if you if you're trying to simply look at Christianity through a through a educated worldview, everything falls in a place. And so, because the wages of sin is death, in other words, your paycheck for what you have been working hard on, your sin. There is going to be a paycheck for that, a payment, and that is death. You don't have to be a biblical scholar or a theologian to recognize that your sin, that your mistakes, that your rebellion against God, or simply your rebellion against what the world and culture would call morality, that our rebellion against what is right and what is good leads us to death. It leads us to a physical death. But sadly, the Bible tells us that our physical death, it would be nice if we would just simply die, be put in six feet under in our grave, and then just have the worms eat our flesh for the rest of eternity. That would be nice. Oh, that would be nice. Oh, but there is an eternal reality that if there is a heaven, there is also a hell. And that for eternity, that the wages, that the payment of our sin, we will go ahead and cash out for eternity. There in the pit of hell, in the suffering of hell. And, and forget the fires, forget the, the smells, forget the chains, forget the different things that the Bible and other people have described. It is the reality of never being able to call on God for help, but being there for all eternity and calling on God and saying, I don't feel your presence. Jesus, where are you? Jesus, where are you? And it wasn't that he sent you to hell, but it was that we chose while we still had an opportunity. We chose that hell for all eternity. We mocked God. We played our little games here on earth. We did it our own way. And then we will have to cash it out and be there for all eternity in a separate Separation from God. There is no greater hell than that. So what are we saying? We need to do things right now while we still can to make things right. We need to change some of those habits. And remember, if you want to change your life, if you want to change your life, you change your habits. If you want to change your habits, what do we do? We let God change our hearts. If we want to change the way we've been acting, go ahead and put that slide. If you want to change your life, change your habits. If you want to change your habits, you let God change you from the inside out. The first week we talked about self-examination. Stop trying to blame the rest of the world for your own rebellion. Stop trying to be this person that is always a victim to the world. And so because of that, this is who you are. We live in a culture that loves that right now. Oh, it's because I'm Mexican that I act this way because they've been a racist against me. Oh, they've treated me this way in my poverty and, then, and, and they've given me this world. So because of the racism in the world, this is why I'm acting this way. And so we live in a world that we love to blame exterior things. And yes, there is a reality of how things, we are affected by exterior things and how people treat us. But if that reality is keeping us captive, it is a lie of, of hell. We need to be freed from that. Yes, we need to be delivered from those thoughts. We need to be freed from thinking that it's someone else's fault that we're going through this problem. And so we, the first week, talked about having self-examination, being self-aware. 
being self-aware of, of our own actions, allowing the, the Bible to be a mirror into our souls, that we don't simply pick and choose whatever we want to hear so that it can make us feel good, but we allow God to change us from the inside out. That's what this whole series has been about. Why? Because God is moving quickly. He is preparing all of you, all of us. He is creating a mighty army of God for this time, for this hour. He is coming very soon and all the signs are showing it. And so regardless of what you may think and you may feel like, well, nothing's changing, nothing's happening, it's going quick, let me tell you. And so because of that, He is preparing us quickly. And I want you to receive this and receive it in a mature manner. That you say, God, I don't want to simply keep going through the same garbage I've been going through my whole life. And and just going year after year, the same problems, the same needs, the same prayer. But God, help me mature. The Bible says that we get to go from glory to glory. That we get to go into this other level with God. Let's go into new levels with God. Let's not allow ourselves to still be in the same valley. Come on. There are mountains that we need to climb in Jesus' name. But we need to be self-aware. We need to allow ourselves to say, these are the things that I need to change about myself. I don't have control about how the world's going to act and how they're going to respond. But there are things that I need to change about myself. Because, yes, we could blame the world. But we cannot stand in front of God one day and say, well, it was the racism. It was the sexism. It was this and that. It was the Democrats' fault and it was the Republicans' fault. We can't blame. We can't stand in front of God and say, uh, it was Obama. Uh, it was Trump. It was Biden. We can't stand in front of God and blame anyone else because it will be between us and him. And so at that moment, we get an opportunity right now to be self-aware about ourselves. But then we talked about this simplicity that we must be having. This idea of recognizing that because we have Jesus, we have enough. That we need to stop trying to strive for all of these things uh, that this world gives us and sells us. And we're waste time in that. But it's a need for simplicity. And we, last week, we talked about slowing down or solitude, about us taking the time to go and not just get rid of things and stuff and ignore some of the garbage that's being given to us all the time, but for us to go and get away from the noise of this world and to be able to finally just listen to his voice, that we need to go to a quiet place of solitude, to go be with Jesus and to simply meditate on what he promises us, that he speaks to us and we must listen. That some of you, I know that this week, I hope that you have been taking this time and some of the things that you hear, some of the things that you have to face in that quietness, we don't always like it. It's difficult, but I hope that this week has been a good week of you finding solitude with the Lord and Him challenging you and Him, again, making you self-aware of some things, but then allowing ourselves to not only stop there, not only be able to say, okay, I've spent some time with the Lord. I think that a lot of us today uh, love the presence of God. It's so evident in in, uh, different uh, prayer times and and worship services and concerts and and camps and and conferences. It's so evident that people love the presence of God. What what is not to love? But again, if it's all, all that it is, it's just us sitting there, soaking it all in and receiving and being filled. But we are not responding with a change of heart. We are not responding to making things right, as Paul said. Then we are just wasting our time, and it is foolishness. Next week, we'll talk about steadfastness or or faithfulness, about not giving up too soon. But today, today's habit is the one habit that truly the devil doesn't want you to ever begin, a habit that he doesn't want you to have. He is your spiritual enemy, and he wants to keep you from this spiritual habit. He wants you to to not be able to be freed from the things that you have never been able to be freed from. He wants to keep you living in shame. He is your enemy. He wants you distant from God. This is a fallen angel. 
that he had heaven to his to for, for his own self. He had a position in heaven as an angel. But when he desired the worship for himself, he became a fallen angel, a cursed angel, that God said, like a snake, you will have to drag yourself and eat dirt for all eternity. That he is the one that had it all but lost it all. That he will never have an opportunity. He is he is truly experiencing the hell that I described earlier. He is experiencing that and he is saying, I will do everything possible to not allow those humans that he created in his own image. Oh, he is jealous of the love of God that we sang earlier about. He is jealous of the way that if you would just simply call on God, you will be saved. He is jealous that he will never have that opportunity. And so he will try everything possible to not be in hell alone, but he will drag the same way that he dragged the other fallen angels with him, them being now demons. He will do everything possible to drag us with him. He is the enemy that is only out to steal, to kill, and to destroy you and your life. And the world mocks it. The world laughs. The world is saying we're celebrating in our death. Oh, but he is celebrating because he knows that he is separating us from God. He is keeping us distant from God, keep you from fulfilling your calling that God created inside of you since your mother's womb. This is the habit of godly sorrow. This is the habit of what the Apostle Paul said there to the second letter to Corinthians. A godly sorrow. Get rid of your guilt is what we're saying this morning. Get rid of of this spiritual reality in which we live in. It is a shame. It is a guilt. Some of you are here because you need a prayer answered. You need healing. You need God to provide. You need a miracle. You need a miracle with your family. You need a miracle with your spouse, with your kids. You are asking God and you show up to church week after week and you've come to the right place. Some of you are here because you genuinely simply love God and want to spend time in His presence. Again, we love His presence. Or you're here to spend time with your Christian family, with other believers. You don't want to simply stay at home and worship alone. You want to do this with others. All of these are good reasons to be here. But we need to make this a place. This right here needs to be a place of sacrifice. This must be a place where we can bring our shame, our guilt, our mistakes, our sins, and sacrifice them at the altar of God. This must be a place where we don't simply come and allow the enemy to fill us with more lies, to fill us with more feelings of negativity, for us to walk out feeling just down about, about ourselves and arguing and, and making it the problem about everybody else. But this has to be a place where we recognize our need for God and we become a living sacrifice. This is not... Simply, many of you have been suffering while you hide from God, while you keep in your quietness, in your, I'm not going to bring this up to anyone, I'm not going to bring this up to God. While you hide, you suffer. Hiding in your shame, hiding in your guilt. But this is not what our Father desires from us. As the Apostle Paul said, this is what He wants. But some of us are living in point number one, in a worldly sorrow. And this worldly sorrow is leading us to the road to regret. Worldly sorrow is simply the road to regret. Worldly sorrow is sad because you got caught. You haven't truly been broken because of it. You would still be doing it if you didn't get caught. Worldly sorrow is this feeling of, oh no, everything in my life is falling apart now. I feel bad. I'm sad. I got caught. This really is messed up. I really messed things up. Or you just feel guilty before God and you're constantly live with this word called remorse. We'll talk about that word right now. Simply feeling bad about yourself. 
It says in Hebrews chapter 12, the author of Hebrews says in verse 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter roots grow up to cause trouble and defile many. That worldly sorrow creates bitter roots. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. Esau, who for a single meal, who is this Esau in the Old Testament in the book of, of, of Genesis, in the soap opera called Genesis? You see the story of a man named Jacob and his brother Esau. Jacob being jealous of his brother, he being the firstborn, the firstborn traditionally at that time received the blessing from the father. But Esau being, uh, but Jacob being this jealous brother, he wanted the blessing. And he connives and he does everything to try to receive that firstborn blessing. It wasn't just a prayer, but it was all the inheritance of the father would go to the firstborn. That the blessing, that the protection, that the that the honor, that the authority that is only given to the authority Jacob wanted to the firstborn, he wanted it for himself. And so he does, and he connives, and he and he messes with everything so that he could receive the blessing. And now Esau, it says that he, for a single meal, sold his inheritance right as the oldest son. There was a moment where Esau is hungry. He just came back from work, and, and, and Jacob is inside of his house just cooking up a good meal, and he gives him this bowl of lentil soup. And I've never had lentil soup. I think Koala likes it. I don't, it just looks like some weird stuff, lentejas. It even sounds gross in Spanish to me. And, and I see it and I'm going, that, that is what Esau gave up. His birthright, his authority, his inheritance, all the goodness of God. Oh, but sometimes we might, we might blame Esau, but sometimes we need to be real, real careful about looking down on people and what made them fall. Because in the same way that I look at lentil soup, I would say, really? He left God for her? Really? She left her relationship with God and she was on fire for Jesus for him. Really? He is allowing that sight on his phone to just destroy his spiritual life and his authority and all the goodness of God in his life for that garbage? Seriously? But that's what Saul did. Saul gave it all up for this little bowl of soup. And he even said, I'll give up my birthright. He even declared it with his mouth. Be careful what you say with your mouth. He said it with his mouth and he said, sure, 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 Jacob. I'm hungry. Just give me the bowl. Yeah, yeah, you can have my birthright. He didn't really recognize how, how real and how much power was in his words. Well, everything happens and, and, and Jacob messes with his father, Isaac. And, and he, Isaac, in his old age, not being able to see, ends up blessing Jacob instead of Esau. And Esau finds out in verse 17 afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He wanted to go back to his father, Isaac. And Isaac says, I'm sorry. This is, this is, this is above my, my pay grade. If it was me, says Isaac, I would, I would still bless you and I would still do everything. But you sold all this. Jacob took the blessing now. It doesn't make too much sense to us in our 2024 world in our culture today, but again, that birthright, that firstborn, the blessing, the authority, the inheritance that the firstborn had. Esau was trying to get it back, and it says that he wanted it, but he was rejected, even though he sought the blessing with tears. By this time, it was too late. He could not change what he had done. Again, Esau sold his birthright for a meal and later regretted it bitterly. That's bitterness. That worldly sorrow is what he was experiencing. It wasn't simply this repentance of which we will speak on. It wasn't truly this understanding really what he had just done. It was simply, oh no, I have lost my blessing. I messed up. Oh no, what did I do? Oh please, give me this blessing back. And it was too late. But just like Esau, we can't change what we have done ourselves. Esau was trying to fix the problem by himself, which led him to more bitterness, which led him to anger and vengeance. He wanted to now kill his brother. 
He, he, was, he was looking for blood because he just, that bitterness and sadness and anger led him to want to kill his own brother. Because we cannot help ourselves. That's why we live with so much regret and frustration. A frustration that leads to spiritual death and that will eventually lead to a physical death as a shared for all eternity. That's why when we get caught in our sin, that's why when we've recognized what we've done, anybody here cheated on the test before? Anybody here just somehow you did something at, at school or, you, or you've done something and, and I'm trying to find something that's, you know, something cute, something PG, but maybe you've been caught cheating on your girlfriend. Maybe you've been caught cheating on your taxes. Maybe you've been caught doing something, stealing from work. That paper clip turned into the, the, the whole box, turned into a, a few staples and the whole stapler, and then, and then turned into just some cash here and some cash there and, 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 and all of this stuff. Maybe that's you. And then you finally got caught and you got fired. Maybe you felt bad about yourself. And then you started feeling bitter. And you started blaming your boss and your coworkers and people and society and culture and the system and the man. And then, then it's everybody else's fault. And there's this bitterness, this anger, and this desire for vengeance, this desire to get back at someone because really it was my wife's fault or really it was my husband's fault that I ended up cheating on them. If they would have treated me the way I deserved or whatever. We start making it about others. But that bitterness becomes a reality of us living in, in our own consequences of what we've done. And we just feel terrible on the inside and it just begins to attack us. No wonder there's so many people, especially young people today, that are living in anxiety. They're living in depression. That don't want to face the world because they're just living with all their thoughts and all their feelings because there is something deep inside of them that says they need a Savior, but they just can't seem to help themselves uh, and get out of that that problem and they try different stuff and they try something that they could smoke and they try something that they could chew and they try something that they could drink and they try something that they could snort and they try something that they could uh, uh, cut themselves and do different things that trying to somehow find some peace but nothing is helping because we cannot help ourselves when we are stuck in our own guilt it just leads us to spiritual and yes even physical death like a man named Judas. It says in Matthew 27, verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, Jesus, saw that Jesus was condemned, what did Judas think was going to happen? Well, they were just going to talk to Jesus. Just maybe have a good conversation with him. Tell him to stop preaching about the kingdom of God and he was the son of God. But no, he saw that he was being condemned and he was seized with remorse. Remorse took over his mind, his heart, his thoughts, and returned the 30 pieces of silver, the amount that you would buy a slave at that time. He got that payment for the life of Jesus. He goes back to the ones that had authority and gave him the money. Well, he just simply throws the silver back at them. He says, keep it. I can't. I don't want it. That money is, is, is dirty. He throws it back to the chief priests and the elders. He betrays Jesus for those 30 pieces of silver and then ended his own life in despair. Luke in Acts chapter 1 tells us a story. In Acts chapter 1 verse 18, with the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. Maybe they didn't, get, they didn't take the money and he finally said, fine, I'll take the money. He bought the field where he fell headlong whether it was on purpose or whether it was as an accident, he fell on his head and his body burst open and all of his intestines spilled out. Doesn't seem like an accident. But everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field, field in their language, a kaldama. That is field of blood. The conscience, his thoughts... His bitterness, his sorrow, his, his worldly sorrow, his, his remorse led him 
to what some theologians and historians would say was even suicide. It was so much that he just couldn't live anymore, any longer. But maybe it wasn't suicide. As I read that now, it looks more like also maybe it was simply the curse of death. Of what Romans says, once again, the wages of sin is death. He was cashing out what he had done. The curse of death fell on him and he died a painful death in what is now the field of blood. For both Esau and Judas, their sorrow was so real, but it didn't lead to life-giving repentance. It only led to more pain, to more regrets, because worldly sorrow leads to remorse. And remorse leads to spiritual death. Worldly sorrow leads to remorse. And this remorse, this feeling of, of I have no control, I have done wrong, look what I've done, leads to spiritual death. What's the definition of this word? Remorse, the dictionary says, it is a deep regret coming from a sense of guilt for past wrongs. But this is what I found the most powerful about this definition. It is self-reproach. You are punishing yourself. That you allow the devil to speak all those lies to tell you, look what you have done. Look at you deserve. You know, when he's speaking some truth. Because the devil loves to preach to us. The devil loves to remind us of uh, the curse that we have caused on our own life. The devil is reminding us of how we are so unworthy. Look what you have done. You don't deserve to go to church. You don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve to worship and lift up your hands. You're such, you're such a hypocrite. Look what you just did on your way to church. Look what you just did last night. And there you are just sitting there being so fake. You are such a hypocrite. And all those lies and all those thoughts create this remorse of self-reproach. You begin attacking yourself. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. If you come from a religious background that teaches you that, literally kneeled on the ground, kneeling, walking, and dragging yourself to the cathedral, shouting to God and recognizing that you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, and telling God, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I know I've done these things wrong, but you have this self-reproach, this remorse, that's all you can do on your own. That's all you can do. You're stuck there in your sin. Worldly sorrow is when we're sorry for the consequences of our actions, not for the actions themselves. It's like getting, getting a speeding ticket. And you get pulled over and you're mad and you're upset. Not be, be, because you did something wrong, but because of the ticket. Because of what you have to pay now because of the fine that you owe, not about the danger that you cause to others. The kind of sorrow keeps us stuck in a cycle of guilt and shame without any change. It's that feeling that you feel as soon as you sin. That's, that's not godly. That is worldly. It is this feeling of, oh, what did I do again? <sighs> Didn't I just go to church this morning? Wasn't I in church just a few minutes ago and here I am again doing the same thing all over again? Going through the week and saying, Pastor said about us living this faith on a Monday morning and here I am doing it again. Did God next month and here I am again doing the same thing again? And it's this feeling not about the thing, but about being caught it leads you back to just feeling the same remorse over and over. Christian author C.S. Lewis says this, no man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. In other words, the more you try to try to fix things yourself, the more you're like an Esau or like a Judas trying to get things right with God on your own, it will just remind you of how bad you truly are. And how much in need you truly are. 
No man knows how bad he is till he has tried so very hard to be good. You cannot do this on your own. Worldly sorrow keeps us trying to be good on your own, leading to frustration. But godly sorrow brings us to a place of surrender where we let God's grace transform us from the inside out. Almost 300 years ago, in 1741, a man named Jonathan Edwards, he wrote a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And this man, a pastor, a preacher, an evangelist, 300 years ago, he would stand on the fields and he would preach and the people who had never heard these truths found out that they were sinners and that there was an angry God. Not so much with us, but with the sin that we were living in. An angry God that hated that devil, that enemy that was destroying the people he created. If you don't believe in an angry God, go back and read that Genesis story of Noah and the ark. He was not happy. He was not happy and pleased with how people had rejected him. And he had to punish the sin on this earth. In the same way, Jonathan Edwards wrote this sermon. And just imagine those words today. And let these words from 300 years ago speak to your heart this morning. If you're lying to yourself and you're saying, I'm good and this sermon is for the person next to me. If you're saying, I'm fine, I don't like all this, I'm good, I, I, I don't need to hear this for myself. I hope that this sermon, 300 years old, speaks to your heart right now. And that just, a, just a small quote from it. He says, Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it. He depends upon himself for his own security. He flatters himself on what he has done and what he is now doing or what he intends to do. Hell. Really? There is no need to know a God, a Savior. There is no such thing as sin. I live in my truth. I live in my own reality. I am educated. I am a modern thinker. I am not conservative. I, am, I have liberal thoughts. I am able to live without a God, and I declare that God is dead, they say. There is no need for a God or a Savior. And nothing much has changed in those 300 years. As Jonathan Edwards says, they flatter themselves and what they have done for themselves. Do you know who I am? Do you know what my education is? Do you know where I live? Please, let the, let the poor, let the, let the ignorant in education, let them receive a Savior. They need it. <laughs> That's why it's, I, I can't imagine for me to try to preach to billionaires to preach in the suburbs. I, I, I don't know because there is such a, a, a trust in what they have and what they own. At least we recognize that there is something more that we need than just the, the earthly, earthly, worldly, uh, materialistic, financial things that we could somehow strive for here on earth. We need something greater. But the sinner is saying, no, as long as they're in that ignorance, they're saying there's no need for all of this. He goes on. It would be a wonder if some that are now present should not be in hell in a very short time. It would be a wonder that some that are present in this room may not be in hell in a very short time before this year is out. And it would be no wonder if some persons that now sit in here, this meeting house, you sit here in health and quiet and secure should be there in hell before tomorrow morning. That is the reality. Not much has changed 300 years later. And he goes on. The God that holds you over the pit of hell. The God that has the control over your life. He's holding you from being able to be devoured by the enemy who is wanting to destroy your life. He is holding you. God is. But much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire. Pastor Jonathan Edwards is trying to help you understand that there is nothing good in us. 
that we are pitiful, that we have nothing good, that we can somehow uh, prove ourselves to gain ourselves and to win ourselves out of hell, that we are just like a little spider over the fire, abhors you. He, he is angry at the sin that you're living in and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath, the wrath of God, of His, of his righteousness towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast out into the fire. Oh, receive that today. Receive that young person today. Receive that knowing that, yes, you've heard about, about how much God loves you. You've heard about how much God just does everything for you so that you will not go to hell. But you need to understand how much he hates the sin that we continue to live in. He hates it so much that he gave his son and he died for it. He died and suffered on the cross for us. He hates the sin. He hates the one that just continues to ignore his goodness and his grace. And we run back to the same things and to the same person. And we continue to live in the same way. Oh, I pray that this morning you feel the wrath of God over your life. That you recognize that there is a God who will punish the sin and the game that we play. There is a God. And He says you are 10,000 times so abominable in His eyes as the most hateful and venomous serpent is in ours. Just know that we need a Savior. We need something more than the things that we could prove to others about. You could show yourself off to others and try to show how much, how much you have gained in this world and the success in your world, and you become the greatest influencer alive. But in the eyes of God, all you are is a sinner. And His wrath and the good judgment of God, as I've said before, we all want God to be fair. We all want fairness. We all want justice until it has to do with us. As soon as it has to do with us, then we say, well, God have mercy. God have grace. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we can do ourselves to get out of that place in which we call sin. If you keep trying, it leads you right back to remorse. And it leads you right back to a worldly sorrow. And it leads you right back to this feeling. No wonder Judas took his life. No wonder he was just, just battling with his, and we say it today, it's a, it's, a, it's a normal saying, I'm just battling with my demons. No wonder we need a true freedom from all of this. No wonder we need a true biblical deliverance. No wonder we need to be freed from the lies of this society that tells us, you got this, you're good on your own. You are more than enough. You, 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 you are good on your, on your own and yourself. And all this self-glorification that leads us to think that we don't need a Savior. We need a Savior. That's what leads us to number two. Not worldly sorrow that leads to this feeling of remorse. But number two, godly sorrow. Godly sorrow that is the road to repentance. That leads us to repent. We need a godly sorrow. There is a difference. Some of you might say, why is pastor bringing this up? Because God loves you. Because He wants you to be saved. Because Jesus Himself said, I did not come to simply judge this world, but to give everyone the opportunity to repentance. To give everyone the opportunity to salvation. He has come to save the world because He loved it. And He still loves us. Godly sorrow that leads to repentance. This is what He desires from us. Jesus, in the greatest sermon ever told on the Sermon on the Mount, He begins with Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
This poverty has nothing to do with an earthly financial poverty, but a poor in spirits, a, hum a humility of the heart, a, 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 a recognizing of I am a sinner. I have nothing to prove. I am empty inside. I have done everything that is wrong. I have read the word and have tried to find a different way out, but I cannot do it myself. I am poor and I have nothing to give to you. I am just a wretched sinner that deserves death. My God, forgive me. That is what poverty of spirit is that gives us finally the kingdom of heaven. Oh, you want heaven? You want the kingdom of God? You want to experience the goodness, the mercies, the grace, the peace, the joy everlasting, the strength that only comes from Him? You want to feel that feeling of being enough? If you're tired of feeling in remorse, if you're tired of feeling in, in despair, if you're tired of feeling with the bitterness, if you're tired of feeling angry because you got caught, if you're tired of feeling just, just empty inside because you continue to go back to the same garbage and you just feel this shame and this guilt in front of the eyes of God. Oh, may you have a poor spirit. May you be able to go to Him in your shame, in your guilt, and say, God, I have nothing but this. This is who I am. Get to that point, church. Get to that point, my brother, my sister. To get to God and say, I have nothing, nothing, nothing left. I've tried to prove myself to the world and that just brought me more shame. I try to prove myself to you, God, and all I get is to recognize and realize I am a sinner. But then he says that when you get to that moment, oh, I know that we like to use this verse 4 in, in funerals and, and, and yes, it's true. That when we're mourning, that when we're sad, that he comes in and comforts us. Oh, but it goes so much more deeper than that. That when we recognize that we are dead inside, that it's not just about the dead loved one in a casket, but it's about the death, the spiritual death inside of ourselves. That we get to the moment to realize I am dead inside. I, I cannot save myself. I am empty. I am broken. Oh, I am so lost without you, Savior Jesus. I need you. That at that moment, He sends every angel of heaven. That He sends the very presence of His Spirit. And He comes and He comforts us. And you know what He says at that moment? He whispers in our ear as He puts His arms around us. And He says, You are forgiven, my son. You are forgiven, my daughter. You are mine. You are mine. But it takes this. It takes a, poor, a poverty of spirit. It takes a mournful heart. Oh, how beautiful it is when we're able to have a godly sorrow in front of our God. It says in Psalm 51, I know I've read it many times the last few months, but it just goes back to this. In verse 16, and I'll read it from the New Living Translation. In verse 16 it says, Oh God, you do not desire a sacrifice. I will bring you all and offer one. I would offer you the biggest ox, the biggest bull, the, 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 the sheep, the animals. I will bring you all the money, God. I will sacrifice to you thousands of dollars if that would bring me salvation in heaven, God. I will bring you all that, but you don't desire that. He says the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit, is a poverty of heart, is a mournfulness, is a godly sorrow. You will not reject the broken and repented heart, oh God. If you're tired of living in despair, if you're tired of living in this feeling of just emptiness and, and, and worldly sorrow, He's telling you to come to Him and finally just give your own life as a sacrifice to Him. In the ancient world, repentance was often this, this public act in the Jewish culture, it, it involved rituals like, like fasting. I'm not going to eat. I want people to know that, that I am repentant. I, I feel This is going to affect my physical life. I don't just feel bad about it emotionally. I don't just feel bad about it because I got caught. No, I'm, I, I won't even eat. Oh, well, some of you know how that feels. When you, have, when you know, when you know that you have failed God, 
that, that, that you try to even eat and there's something inside of you that is just, uh, there's this, there's so much despair. And there's this, this feeling of, of I, I just, I just can't, I can't even eat. So they would fast in public. They, they, they be, they would wear, they would take off their beautiful robes and they would wear literally sackcloths. They would wear potato sacks. Think of that. <laughs> Because they were, they wanted to, to prove to the, to others that, that, that I am repenting of what I've done. And they would put ashes. They would burn leaves and burn palm trees and burn different things. It's, it's one of the reasons why the Catholic Church uses that tradition of, of, of Ash Wednesday. Because it is a public recognition of what is happening on their hearts that they would go and pour ashes on their head. And they would walk around with this, with this, with this uh, a physical outward uh, a recognition to the world to say, this is what's happening inside my heart. But King David, after his sin with Bathsheba, again, he wrote this psalm, Psalm 51. And he's expressing his deep sorrow and repentance. He knew that true repentance... Not just fasting from food, not just wearing a potato sack, not, not just putting ashes on your head, not just going to a cathedral and, and turning on a, a candle and, and putting some ashes on your forehead, not just going to a church and, and falling and, and, and getting emotional at the altar, not just simply saying, oops, God, sorry, I did it again. Not just simply mocking God with our literal religious games. But he knew, David knew that true repentance meant a change of hearts, not just outward actions. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter says this, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Look at that. This is what godly sorrow, what repentance does. It leads us to refreshing. It leads us to life. Godly sorrow isn't just about feeling bad just to feel bad. It's about recognizing our mistakes, turning away from them, and moving towards God. When we experience godly sorrow, we admit our sins and ask God for help to change to actually change, to become a new man, a new woman, to not just simply dress it up, but to be born again. Because remorse leads you to feeling bad about what you did, but repentance leads you to feel bad about what you did, and then you turn from it. Some of you, you did something wrong, you still get defensive about it. You still make excuses. You still blame someone else. You still blame something else. You, you, you still say it's not my fault. You feel sorry. You feel sorry because you got caught. Sorry because it hurt you because of the consequence. Sorry because you're simply blind and how it hurts others instead of drawing you to God which is a godly sorrow, a poor in spirit that leads you to run to Him as the, as the prodigal son was stuck in the mud of his sin and he's there around the pigs and he says, my God, my God, I have sinned against you and heaven alone and God forgive me of what I have done. I need to run back to my Father. You see, repentance leads you to run to God, not run from Him because as long as you're running from Him, you are running towards death. You are leading your own self to the pit of hell. But when we are finally able to recognize our need for repentance, it leads you to run to Him. Godly sorrow leads to repentance and leads to salvation. Godly sorrow leads you to a repentance, to a repented heart that leads you to a godly salvation. Oh, but let me add one more thing. Because some of you have said, oh, I have, sa I have salvation. I'm going to heaven. I I'm, I'm, I'm not going to die in my own sin. But this is still hard. And I still go back to the same things. And I'm trying my best, Pastor. Oh, but let me, I forgot one more point on this. That true godly sorrow leads to repentance, leads you to salvation, that leads you now to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, it's time for you to stop pausing there. Oh, because when you go to the cross, He turns us around. 
and we're still here and it's not heaven yet. We need more than just our own physical strength. It just leads us back to godly sorrow. I mean, to worldly sorrow. We need the spirit of God. What the Old Testament, or excuse me, what the old King James would say. The old King James called it the Holy Ghost. We need the spirit of God to fill us, to fill us like never before. We cannot do this alone. We cannot try to live just in the bitterness and try to fix things ourselves. Oh, let's not be religious. Let's, let's be supernatural about this. Let's cry out to God and ask God to fill us. It is a repentance. That word, re, to return. Penance. Think of penthouse. The penthouse, the highest level of the building. So when we re repent, we are returning to the highest one. That we ourselves were created in his image in our mother's womb. That he called us son. He called his daughter at that moment. But because of this world, because of the influences, because of the sin of this world and the culture that leads us to sin, we need someone to help us to do this, to repent. The Spirit of God is here right now. The Spirit of God is the one that's speaking to you right now. You could be foolish enough as the Spirit of God is bringing a real conviction to you this morning. And He is opening up the earplugs from your ears. You could be foolish enough to just simply put those earplugs right back in and walk out the same way that you came in because you don't want to deal with that. Not right now. And as Jonathan Edwards said, then some of you might end up in hell tomorrow morning. But this morning, he is giving you the opportunity for you. He won't force himself on you. No one ever will, much less God. But he is allowing you, Holy Spirit, he is unplugging your ears. And at this moment, you are able to unplug them fully, to receive and to repent and to return to the highest place. Stop living in the basement of your sin. Stop living in the, in the gross mud under the place where he wants you to be living in. He wants you to return to that penthouse. It is a U-turn. It is a turning around. It is no longer living the same way. It's not just cleaning yourself off and dusting yourself off and you keep walking to the same thing. That's foolishness. It is turning around in the security that God gives you now to now receive now a new life. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Don't you see how wonderfully kind He is? How tolerant and patient God is with you? Yes, He has wrath over the sin, but He has been patient and merciful. Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Oh, I thank God that there was a man that was brave enough 300 years ago to preach that we are sinners in the hands of an, of an angry God. But I thank God that he finished the sermon this way. That he goes back and he says, and now you have an extraordinary opportunity. The, the, the historians of the church say that, that the people that were listening to the sermon of Jonathan Edwards, that they're in their wooden pews, were scratching the pews because they were going, what are we going to do? We're going to go to hell. He's, he's preaching us the truth. And, and the truth is not setting us free right now. It is just make, making us recognize that there is, that there is a, a, a hell for us and we're going to die there. And so as they were scratching their pews, they were, they were waiting for an answer. And he says, and now you have an extraordinary opportunity. A day wherein Christ has flung the door of mercy wide open and stands in the door calling to poor sinners. A day wherein many are flocking to Him and pressing into the kingdom of God to see so many others feasting while you are pining and perishing. Stop wasting your time and stop accepting and just living life for less. He's saying you are pining, you are perishing to see so many rejoicing and singing for joy of heart, while you have cause to mourn for sorrow of heart, and foul for vexation of spirit. Oh, just fancy British words 300 years ago. To simply say, while you have an opportunity right now, that the doors of mercy are wide open, that you can simply live in your worldly sorrow, or you finally could repent and call on Him, and stop trying to dress it up, and stop trying to be cute about it and say that everything's fine. That God understands. No, He doesn't. He's been very clear. 
And he's telling you very clear right now that your steps are leading you to hell. But that at the same moment, you have an opportunity right now that your steps could lead you to salvation. So what's the method behind all this? Jonathan Edwards and his sermons, along with John Wesley and these men of God 300 years ago, it, 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 it became this, this great move of God, this great experience of God, that it wasn't just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then people said, oh, okay, I'm a Christian now. And then they were going to churches. But it was inside the church that even the pastors were a bunch of drunks. And a bunch of immoral fornicators that, that the Corinthian, that Paul would write to the Corinthian church, he would write to the same church of 300 years ago. And so Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley and, and, and others would, would begin to preach these sermons of repentance, of calling on God, but it wasn't just simply feeling sorry, but to receive now salvation, to receive the Spirit of God. To receive the Holy Spirit move of God. We call ourselves Pentecostals. I need you to stop thinking that Pentecostalism or that being a Pentecostal is a denomination. Oh no, sorry. I was brought up Baptist or I was brought up Catholic. So that's weird to me. It's not. It's not It's just simply a denomination. Joe Olstein's dad, John Olstein, he would say Pentecostalism is not simply a denomination. It is an experience. It is the very move of God. It is the move of God that we get to actually experience. Because if it says it in the book of Acts, it's truth for us today. That if Jesus walked on water and he resurrected on the third day, then I believe that he also just showered with his Holy Spirit the fire of God about, about the, 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 above the disciples that were there in the upper room and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We need that right now, church. Oh, we need that right now. You want to still live offended? You want to still live bitter at the world because they're sinners? You want to still live just, just feeling angry and upset at this world? You need the Holy Spirit to give you power from within. To recognize that you have been called to be light in the darkness. To recognize that you've been called to be now the one that is not there to be bitter and angry at the world. But to live knowing that God has called you to bring His good news. The Holy Spirit does that. So we first have to recognize our guilt. These are the steps. These are the methods. This is what they, they, they started calling themselves. The, or people started calling them the Methodists. Because they were saying, you have to hear the word. The word sets you free. It, it, it sounds a little bit like, like what people are talking about today. About, about being delivered. <laughs> you, you, you see, they, they, this is, this is a, a, a funny little thing to me that, that's been happening recently. We hear about deliverance and we hear about demon possession i want you to understand church as far as me and my house is, is concerned as far as our church is concerned as far as we understand the word of god the word of god not not a prophet not not a new teacher not a new pastor not a new movement that there's trends that happen this is just another little trend that is happening right now i'm not talking that deliverance isn't in the bible it is but to simply say that a, a deliverance is a, is a five-step program that you also have to pay money for, by the way. That you have to give a donation or give some money to be able to attend this five, 12-step, 15-step, six-year, six-month program, whatever it is. You know what that program of deliverance is called? It's called sanctification. And it's biblically called the rest of our life. We must live in this. You are in the program right now, by the way. If you've given yourself to Jesus, if you're saying, I want to be not only a Christian that goes to churches and, and, and jumps around church after church looking for the new trend. I'm telling you, I, I've been in church for a while now. And if, and if you don't like it, if you want to kick me out as your pastor, go ahead. I've been here 10 years now. I don't have nothing to prove. I want to tell you the truth. I want to, I want to tell you the truth. And, and I remember back in the 90s, it was all about worship. All the, the trend of worship. Oh, oh, you just got to worship him. You just got to worship him. You just got to go and, and sing songs to him. And, and, and that's going to make you free. And you know what happened with that? Is that we put the Bible aside and the word of God aside. And we just started following the trend of worship. It was what some pastors, some real prophets at the time were calling just waves. Just waves that move people from this way to that way. Just going back and forth. The new wave. Then it was all about the wave about, about intercession. Oh, we got to pray. Oh, we got to put everything aside. No more sermons. No more worship. We just got to pray. 
And it was all about, we are an army of soldiers. And we're going to pray. And every single new pastor and modern pastor and every new church was talking about, oh, intercession, prayer, prayer, prayer. Again, there's nothing wrong with worship. There's nothing wrong with prayer. But they put aside worship and they put aside the word of God to simply pray. And what did it do? It caused people to live in ignorance. And they were praying and they didn't know who they were praying to. And there's been trend after trend. We went through the trend of, of, of prophecy, of, of a new reality, of a new uh, revelation. And they started talking about prophecy this and prophecy, uh, prophecy that. And, and I think because there's been so many prophet liars and so many lies, and especially during COVID season and during the Trump administrations and all of this stuff, there's been so many lie, lie after lie of prophecies that so-called prophets, I think people finally got it. And so now there's this whole trend of, of talking about, oh, you got to go through this program of deliverance. And that Pastor Sergio's church, they don't talk about deliverance. Let me talk to you about deliverance. It's called this. It's called being able to have a real godly sorrow and calling on God and saying, I need a savior. I need to recognize my guilt. I am aware of my guilt. It says in Psalm 32, be delivered. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is why, again, the people that were hearing these preachers 300 years ago, they were calling them Methodists because they were saying, you need to go to the altar. You need to go receive salvation, but then you need to go and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they called them Methodists. There is a method. There is, a, there is some things that we must do biblically, and that's it. We need to recognize our guilt. We need to be aware of where we're at. It says in 1 John verse, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. When we confess our sins, it's not just, God, you know I sinned. It is, I recognize I need you. I know that I've done this wrong. The first step is dealing with guilt, is to recognize it. This might seem obvious, but we often bury our guilt deep down, hoping it will just go away. But recognize and acknowledge your guilt before God. Don't hide it. Don't make excuses. Don't blame others. Admit your wrongs. We're taking the first step towards a true healing. We have to acknowledge our sins. C.S. Lewis said, we must lay before, before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. That means that we're always trying to somehow prove to God, okay, I, I, I'm clean now, God. Look, I'm, I'm fine, right? We're, we're good. You're trying, to, you're trying to act what you should be acting like. But we have to come to him in where we actually are in the reality of our sin, in the reality of need of a Savior. But the next step is that we must not only recognize and live in your recognition. That's not enough. Repent of your guilt. It is taking an action. It is repenting of what we have done. So recognize it. Repent. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent and then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And it says in Ezekiel 18, verse 30, Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Turn away. Make a decision. Stop playing the same game. Stop living the same life back and forth, trying to do it your own way. It's always been a cornerstone of our faith. It's always been the foundation of what we believe. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets were constantly telling Israel, repent and turn to God. The psychologist Henry Cloud says, repentance involves a complete transformation of the way we think and act. And the last thing, you don't just repent by saying, God, I'm sorry. God, forgive me. There is this moment of you releasing your guilt. You want to be delivered. You want to be free. You want to stop with the guilt. You want to stop just praying the same prayer. God, why am I always feeling the shame? Why do I still feel guilty? Why am I scared of your second coming? Because I feel like I'm going to get judged by everything I've done. You have to, number three, release. Release your guilt. Uh, the, 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 the theological word for this is absolution. 
you will be absolved. You will be forgiven. You will release. It's no longer yours to carry. It's no longer a shame that we live with. In Romans chapter 1, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, listen, there's some of you that have had everything else, but you missed this. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no more condemnation. There is no more feeling of guilt, of shame. Release it to Him. Let Him take it. Today, I know that I need to intercede with some of you and pray with you because you need to come to this altar and not only repent of your sin, but let it go to Him. So that you're not able to simply go back tomorrow to work and go back to, to your family and you still have this, this fear of hell, this fear of, 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 of punishment, but you're able to finally just be released. Oh, be delivered, be set free. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. He will forget all of our sins. He will forget of all of our wicked ways. He will forgive us of all the things we've done. He is the one that wants us to recognize, to repent, to release. He wants us to be free. We said earlier that people like to say, oh, the demons that I carry, the demons that are with me. Or then there are those that, again, are following the trend of going to some, 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 some pastor, some witch doctor to try to get somehow delivered from, from, a, from, a, from a demon. Guess what? That pastor has no power. That church has no power, and the 12-step program has no power. You know who has power? The blood of Jesus that you called on for salvation. But the problem is that you have not repented of your sin, and you have not released the sin, and you have not released the shame to him. Today, we release, and you will be set free. Today, you will release... Oh, but it will be hard. It will be hard. It will be difficult. There is a devil right now that is telling you, Pastor, just be quiet. I got to go because Chili's is calling. I got to go because the tacos are getting cold. I got to go because I got all these other plans. I got a basketball game to go play right now. But whatever it is, he is saying right now, right now, you have an opportunity. The doors are open for you to call on him. To not live in shame. To not live in regret. There is a future. There is a family. There, are, there is your children and your children's children. that are waiting for you to not live in the same curse. In the same fear. In the same bitterness. In the same sadness and worldly sorrow. But for the sake of your own life. And those of your children and children's children. All be set free today. Say it with me. Recognize. Repeat, repent and release and what we're going to have to do is create this a habit what we're going to have to do is make this into a habit so I would add a fourth word there repeat we got to keep doing this we don't just live We've, we used to say this all the time it's not about just simply songs of worship it's a lifestyle of worship right? we used to say that all the time now today I would tell you, it's not about repenting one time, but a lifestyle of repentance. But us living our life aware, us living our life acknowledging, us living a life of releasing, of just saying, God, I, I did. I messed up today. God, I sinned today. Don't, don't try to dress it up with cute words either. I messed up. It's my downfall. It's my, it's my demons. It's my sin. I've sinned against you, God. Your word says that that's wrong. I fornicated. I sinned. I, 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 I was immoral. I, I did things out of your order, God. I've done things wrong. I've sinned. But he is faithful to forgive, he says. He is faithful to set us free. He's faithful to allow us this moment. He could have simply given you a nice, cute message that leaves you in the same sin that you walked in. But he gives you the opportunity today for us to do that. If you're able to stand there with me. If you need to, to simply take a step of faith. And there's something powerful in the physical action of you walking out of your seat. You're saying to everyone else, I could care less about everyone else, especially you Satan that, that puts shame on me. And you come to this altar right now. 
You simply come and we're going to pray together. And no one else, again, not even God is forcing you. And this isn't about emotionalism. This is about the truth setting you free this day. Repent, Father, we repent. Father, we come to you and we thank you for we acknowledge that we are in need of a Savior. We are in need of a real Savior right now, my God. We don't want to play games with you anymore, my God. We don't want to play religious games anymore, God. Although we dress it up and we come to church and we go through the rituals and we do all the things that we think is right, but we're still living wrong. Father, there's too much in me, God. There's too much in me, God, that I just cannot leave alone. We are a sinner, my God. We recognize that we need you as Savior. We come to you with a poor spirit. We come to you with a poor spirit. Oh, don't let the devil stop you right now and fill you with shame and embarrassment. He's telling you you're fine right there where you're at. Okay, you're going to walk out the same way that you walked in. You're going to deal with it on Wednesday morning. You're going to deal with it on Monday morning. You're going to deal with it years from now because as long as you try to deal with it yourself, you will not be able to be set free. But my God, there are those that are brave enough and courageous enough and just had it and are tired of saying yes to the devil and saying no to you. For a moment now, finally, God, we say yes to you. We say enough is enough. I will not play this game anymore, God. And I will not try to do this on my own, Lord. I've tried enough, and I keep failing, and it's just too hard. But, Father, I repent. I repent. I repent. I want to go to the highest level once again, God. I want to return back to you, Lord. I want to make that U-turn and stop living the same way that I was before. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me not only so that I could come to church and call myself a Christian, Oh, but God, there are people in this room that have been going to church for years now. And they still say, well, that's just who I am, Lord. And they're still lying to themselves. And they have not let go of the same things and the same thoughts. My God, I pray for a true, real deliverance in us today. A freedom from those thoughts. A freedom from those lies. A freedom, God, from not being able to be self-aware of our need for you, Jesus. We repent, my God. We call on you, Savior. We call on you, Savior, and we say, save us. Save us, O oh Lord Jesus. Oh, as the people shouted Hosanna as you came in riding on that donkey that day, my God. Oh, we call out on you, Hosanna. Save us. Save us, O oh King, from our sins. Save us from the things that we continue to do and the consequences of our own sin. Oh, church, as you stand there, as you try to ignore this prayer, as you try to just simply act like everything is fine, oh, just know, just recognize what's been happening in your life. I don't know all the details. I don't know all your background. I don't know all of your secrets. But what I do know that as long as you do not repent, as long as you don't call on his name and surrender completely, you will continue to wake up in the middle of the night feeling guilty and ashamed. You will continue to close the door behind you of your own room and scared and ashamed of what people will see. You will continue to look behind you and over your shoulder because you know that you're living a, a way that you shouldn't be living. And you will continue to be guilty in the, in the face of God and I have the freedom to worship him. You will continue to live in a worldly sorrow that will lead you to death. But God, I thank you that you give us an opportunity right now oh, to call on your name, Jesus. To call on your name like we never have before. And to surrender to you completely. To surrender to you all of our thoughts. All of our thoughts. All of our anger. All of our bitterness. All of our sadness. All of our anxieties. All of our all of our depression everything God that we've gone through Jesus 
every sin, every immoral act, every time that we failed, whether we knew or not, as he, as King David declared and prayed, God forgive me and help me even with this hidden sin that I don't even know about my God. If there is anything that is separating us from you, God, if there is any sin that is keeping us away from the freedom and true deliverance that you have called me to live in, then Jesus, do so right now. Freedom in Jesus' name. There is no Satan. There is no demon that can handle the blood of Jesus at this very moment to purify your heart. To purify your heart. Purify your mind, your thoughts, your motives, your desires in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name right now. Purify in Jesus' mighty name right now. Cleanse us. Cleanse us. Forgive us. Make us new, a new life right now. And Jesus, as we begin to worship you, as we begin to call on your name, Jesus, as we respond to this message, as we respond to your truth, I pray that Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, like never before, I know for a fact that there are some of you in this room that you think you have the Spirit of God, but you don't. That you have played games with God and you call yourself saved, but you're not. The Bible tells us that the first evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just for you to go to church, but to be filled and baptized and be filled supernaturally with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that something even supernatural can happen in you. And I'm not telling you to force anything. And I'm not telling you to somehow be religious and be weird. And I'm not telling you that's keeping you from heaven. Not at all. But what I am saying is that do not limit yourself. Do not limit yourself because you say that you don't understand. That there is a God that is almighty that wants to fill you like never before. That he wants you to experience his real presence that will not be able to stay in this room. That will go further than just crying. That the evidence of the Holy Spirit is not just crying. That is sorrow. That might even be worldly sorrow because you got caught. But there is an evidence of a powerful move of a supernatural spirit in you that he wants to do right now. Right now. Go ahead and play this song. Let us continue to pray. If you need to kneel, if you need to